G'day everyone and welcome to the Shit Flick Critic. I'm your host Andrew Lewis with a very special Christmas episode for you to help usher in the festivities. Now just because this is a Christmas episode, don't expect anything different. I'm not going to wear a silly hat or put up decorations. It's going to be just the same as always. Alright, commence the intro! You know you're going to see the best of the worst with the Shit Flick Critic. You know you're gonna see shit that's absurd with the shit flick critic From Pandemic the Room, the Samurai Cop Troll 2 Man or Sense of Fame, I have any connection to So come along, see the worst with me, I'm the shit flick critic So this episode, we'll be taking a look at the strangest holiday special to ever appear on television and the worst thing made in the Star Wars franchise Not that one Mm-mm Close it's the Star Wars Holiday Special. That's it, I'm turning back. I know your family's waiting. I'll get you back there in time, pal. Trust me. I want the rebels located and identified. If it means searching every household in the system. This unit is occupied by four Wookiees, two adult males, one adult female, and one male child. There's a male missing from this household. It's possible he's one of the rebels we're looking for. Finish the search of the resident. Why do I always think that taking you home for life day is going to be easy? <laughs> The Star Wars Holiday Special is a two hour long TV film that aired on November 17th, 1978 as a way of appeasing the audiences until The Empire Strikes Back's release in 1980. Upon its airing, it received extremely negative reviews and was not re-aired or released to video and is often considered the most ill-conceived thing to ever happen in television history. It has also been completely disowned by the Star Wars community and not considered canon with the rest of the franchise. It is still unknown the level of involvement that George Lucas had had with the film, but what is known is his absolute detest for the special, and has even stated that if I had the time and a sledgehammer I would track down every copy of the special and smash it. And all this coming from someone who made Howard the Duck. <coughs> Even though George Lucas claims he had very little to do with the actual production of the special and personally disowns it, Pat Maloney, the actress who plays Lumpy, has said that Lucas was sent dailies of each day's filming for approval. Lucas also used the same treehouse design for the Wookiee's house that we used in the special in Revenge of the Sith. In May of 1988, there was a copyright transfer giving Lucasfilm sole rights and ownership of the holiday special, with the assumption that the masters would be kept under lock and key and not distributed ever again. The only person in possession of an official copy of the Star Wars holiday special is Carrie Fisher, who only watches it when she feels like guests at her home have outstayed their welcome. The original Star Wars was released in 1977 to sell out audiences, due to its state-of-the-art visual effects, heart-pounding action and contemporary storytelling. Overall, Star Wars was able to make almost $800 million worldwide, compared to its budget of $11 million. But the real money was made in merchandising, merchandising. Given that George Lucas was able to retain all merchandising rights, a buttload of money was made through merchandising. In 1978, Lucas began to worry that the film was starting to fade from the public's conscious while The Empire Strikes Back was being produced and that merchandising sales would drop as a result. In the past, when Star Wars themed variety segments were featured on The Richard Pryor Show and Donnie and Marie, it resulted in a spike of tickets sales in theatres across America. It was then agreed that the most effective way to have people remember the Star Wars brand in between movies and to buy Star Wars toys for the holiday season was to air a feature length holiday special variety show. Variety shows have been a staple of television since the 40s but slowly began to go out of favour in the late 70s due to changing audiences and their extreme cringiness. <laughs> No show was more cringy than the Brady Bunch Variety Hour. Yankee Doodle, keep it up! Yankee Doodle, keep it up! Keep it up! Keep it up! Here we go again! It then came time to decide what the special would be about, and all the best things about Star Wars like Jedi's, lightsabers, intense blaster battles, and outstanding visual effects were not to be included in the special. Instead, Lucas decided that the plot should focus on Chewbacca's family as they anxiously awaited his return so they could celebrate Life Day while their house is ransacked by soldiers of the Empire. Life Day is a kind of Wookiee Christmas slash Thanksgiving holiday where all the Wookiees teleport themselves to a mysterious void where they all don red robes and gather to celebrate the festivities. Once teleported, Chewie and his family are able to interact with all of his friends from the original film, including Luke, 
Leia, C-3PO, R2-D2 and Han Solo. Given that none of these characters are Wookiee, it's not clear why they all possess the abilities to transport themselves for life day. What makes it even more confusing is that the entire special is centered around the fact that Chewbacca can't get home for life day and that his family might have to celebrate it without him. When he does finally return home and they teleport, they meet up with Han Solo anyway. So why couldn't Chewie have just teleported with Han to see his family from wherever they were? saving them both the trouble of making the perilous journey back to Kashyyyk. The story was primarily Lucas's idea and the last thing he contributed towards the special before devoting all of his time to Empire Strikes Back and insisted that the storyline focus on the family of Wookiees. The family includes Chewbacca's wife Mala, his father Itchy and his son Scratchy, I mean his son Lumpy. The issue with having a storyline that centers around a family of Wookiees is that none of them can speak any discernible language. <laughs> and spend the special communicating exclusively in moans with no subtitles. The most disturbing Wookiee moan comes from Lumpy when he's excited, which can only be described as Donald Duck being blended underwater. He sure grown, huh? I think his voice is changed. Christ, I hope not. The lack of dialogue from the Wookiees was even pointed out to Lucas by writer Bruce Valanche, who said the whole thing would turn into one episode of Lassie. What is it, girl? Is it Jeff? You, you don't know where he is? Oh, he's not there yet, is that it? Characters were also shoehorned in as a way to interpret the Wookiee moans for the audience, such as Art Carney's character, Sandorn, the owner of the general store and trader for the Wookiees. The character of Sandorn was actually based on an early concept for Lando Calrassian, both being gambler traders that operate under the nose of the Empire. Most of the cast of the original film make a comeback in the special, and most of it was against their will as it was written in their contract that they had to appear in any promotional material for Star Wars. It was in my contract. <laughs> there was no way, no known way to get out of it. Harrison Ford is clearly the most disenthused by the whole event, and has been very open about how little he enjoyed making the special and how hard it's been to erase the whole thing from his memory. You're like family to me. In one cutaway at the end of the special, he can't even pretend to give a shit about what's going on around him. Mark Hamill reprises his role as Luke Skywalker for the special with an exorbitant amount of makeup on for a pilot about to go and fight the Empire. This was due to the fact that Mark had been involved in a car crash a short while before shooting and the makeup was used to conceal the scars. Why they decided to give him a scar as well? Carrie Fisher has claimed that she has absolutely no recollection of taking part in the special. Whether or not this has anything to do with her substance abuse at the time is unclear, although she does seem to be pretty spaced out for most of the film. I don't know whether this is intentional or not, but Princess Leia seems pretty bitchy in general by either being continually pissed off at C-3PO for constantly interpreting the Wookiee noises for her. She's expressing her warmth towards the traitor. She says there has been no contact. Yes, I think I understand her message. And then for there not being enough English speakers and too many Wookiees in the house. Could you do me a favor and send either Chewbacca or Han Solo to the screen, please? Yeah, sure, I'll just get him for you now. Could he come to the screen, please? All right, hold your fucking horses, I'm getting them. No wonder she didn't give Chewbacca a medal. Carrie Fish has also said that the only reason she took part in the special in the first place was so she could sing a song at the end, which she does moderately well. Pick a key. <laughs> James L. Jones makes a brief comeback as Darth Vader in a scene that was clearly meant for the original film, which is made most evident by the fact that the general who walks with Vader's mouth clearly doesn't sync up with what he's saying. Order the blockade, the curfew, and started a search operation. It's just a matter of time before we find the rebels. I wholeheartedly concur. The supporting cast is made up of Art Carney as Van Damme, Harvey Corman is the incredibly unfunny comedy interludes, and Beatrice Arthur is the cantina owner. All of these actors were well into their 60s at the time of the shooting, far too old to be featured in something as hip and contemporary as a sci-fi space opera. Beatrice Arthur even admitted that she hadn't even seen Star Wars and said, It was a wonderful time, but I had no idea I was even taking part in the whole Star Wars thing. I just remember singing to a bunch of people with funny heads. 
Features Arthur's scene at the cantina is considered one of the stronger scenes in the special, until Harvey Corman enters and ruins the whole thing with his creepy stalker vibe. I found a lot more. Uh, uh. And the whole hole in his head thing. No, please don't pull that in your head. Oh. It's very disappointing to see the sheer lack of laughs that Harvey Corman manages to get in the special, given how absolutely brilliant he is as Headley Lamar in Blazing Saddles. Not Heady, it's headly. I do kind of feel sorry for the guy though, as it seems he just rocked up to set and the director said, Today you're going to be doing a four armed Julia Childs impression. Now, do something funny. Now you're going to be an android malfunctioning for no reason in an instructional video. Now, do something funny. I just work slowly or methodically because this is a job for. Mm. Look at that, nothing. Stony face, and I love a giggle, me, I love a laugh, don't I? A lot of the variety elements fell into place to escape the relentless moaning from the Wookiee family. These variety segments include a bizarre holographic circus act played on a pedestal similar to the one that Dedrick is played on in the original film, an incredibly boring 70s rock ballad by the band Jefferson Starship, some of whose members would go on to form the band Starship and release the most annoying fucking song of all time. <laughs> The cartoon portion, produced by Toronto animation firm Nelvana, is considered the strongest point of the special, and most known for being the first on-screen appearance of Boba Fett before he appears in An Empire Strikes Back. The most bizarre of all the variety segments is the mind evaporator scene. So while Sandorn is over at the Wookiee residence giving them all presents for Life Day, he waits till the end to give Itchy the best present of all. I know what you'd like. <laughs> So in front of the whole family, Sandorn straps Itchy into the machine that can make all of his fantasies come to life, or as Sandorn describes it... One of those that... Uh, it's a real... it's kind of hard to explain, it's a... Uh... Wow. Wow. It seems very strange that someone thought it would be a good idea to have an erotic fantasy simulator in a family-friendly special. Oh, yes. But one thing's for sure, Itchy seems to be having way too much fun. Oh, we are excited, aren't we? Wow! The Star Wars Holiday Special is one of the strangest things you will ever see, and lives up to its name as the worst thing to happen in television. I judge shit flicks based on five categories. The Star Wars Holiday Special is a ride and will give you endless bouts of laughter. Although funny as it is, I can only really stand to see it once a year around Christmas. There are a lot of slow scenes, some of which have absolutely no significance towards the special as a whole, and there's also a lot of very slow, boring Camp 70s songs. Not as good as the original, obviously, due to budget constraints, but all in all, not the worst part about the special. The special was clearly made by Lucas just to make money from merchandising, and as we learned with Food Fight, things that are made solely for the purposes of making money generally don't end. I give the Star Wars Holiday Special minus four stars and will continue to play it at my house every cold Christmas Eve. Or a hot one. If I'm in Australia, it would be a hot one because it's the, it's the Southern Hemisphere, so it, it's out in the summer there. So thank you for joining me on another episode of The Shit Flick Critic and indeed the last episode of 2016. Now, I know this year's been hard on everyone. We've lost a lot of good people, so let's take a moment to reflect on those we've lost. So that's all from me. I hope you all have a wonderful Christmas and a lovely New Year. And if you'd like to give me a present, please subscribe, please like, please leave a comment, let me know what you think. And one last thing before I go, a little sing song. Okay, so thank you very much, and here we go, let's try this, so um, we're going to have The Room, Samurai Cop, Birdemic, Manos Hands of Fate, 
Troll 2 here, and then Food Fight over here. So have a wonderful Christmas. R2-D2, you can't.